On my left, I have Sue Kershaw, who is the Rail Director Europe CH2M, strong background in program management. You brought the work, those skills to work from del transport delivery from London 2012, uh, which is a tremendous feat. And you want to reshape the image of construction, as I understand that. And we're going to talk about how more we, more we can do to bring uh, women in particular into the sector. Howard Collins on the far right here is a CEO at Sydney Rail. Your rail operator was Mike Brown's COO at London Underground and you brought the tube back into operation after 7-7. Extraordinary being here uh, 10 years on. And you are leading a multi-billion, well I would say multi-billion dollar, multi-billion pound uh, transformation of Australia's flagship rail network. And so we're gonna ask you about what uh, lessons we can learn from there. And finally, David Taylor, who is the Ground Transformation Systems Thales organizer and innovator who works closely with Network Rail on key areas for passengers. Um, you know, it's about information, it's about digital uh, and so forth. Um, first of all, uh, Howard Collins, going from here to uh, Australia, what was the difference in culture and what did you have to do that was different? Well, I don't want to steal all of my uh, speech uh, this afternoon, no. but, I, but I would say, um, let's start with uh, the people. Um, you have the world's engineers in Australia. Mm -hmm. And what you see in the f in for women, you see people from Eastern Europe, South America, very, very few UK-based female engineers at all. Uh, you see a great uh, level of drive and energy. The average age in Sydney is 34. The place is growing like never before. And I think we've just not got to think UK. Mm -hmm. We have got to think global, and for young people, maybe there's a couple of years in Sydney, mm -hmm. maybe there's a couple of years and in Dubai, and maybe then in, in UK. You know, we've got to think global. And, and do you feel that the, the, the skills that are being learned here are transferable or not? Definitely. Well, I know that for a fact, for a lot of my signalling engineers turn up at Christmas and commission the UK signalling engineering and then go back to Australia. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot of our technology is UK-based and has been but I certainly think the opportunity not just to think, as after I did, after 35 years of working in the UK, I made that step, and I think it's opened my eyes to saying, let's think globally. They don't want a career. People who are young want to have something that interests them, really gets them involved. They want something outside of work, which may be volunteering. They want to go overseas. They want to really live. They're very, very different from 90% of people in this room who have grafted mm. and charted their career from university. Mm -hmm. And this is making a big difference to women as well, women who are now having families whose husbands are willing to share that 100%, which they weren't. Mm -hmm. And the organisations that look after them are very, very flexible. So the whole world is changing, and the whole dynamic of, of how we work changes. But as do the professions, because construction now is not about concrete on boots. Construction is about sustainability. Construction is about making this country work. And High Speed 2, for example, I'd say to Alison, it's not a rail project. Let's think bigger than that. This is how we're going to change the UK for the future. I mean, Alison knows this, but let's not be parochial on railways, please. Let's think about the impact of our projects on our nation. But it's interesting because it, there was a call to mind for a national uh, you know, infrastructure, you know, a national transport network. Mm -hmm. A kind of really a big thinking kind of grand projet organisation who would who would be much more innovative than individual companies can be, and I wonder if you think that a way to a way to help that as well is to have the idea that engineering is an international skill, and we should actually we should we should be pushing people out. I, absolutely, um, I worked in Thailand for five years, and I was brought up all around the world because my father was a civil engineer. And the one thing I always tell people who are young is go overseas. You learn so much about different cultures. You come back a much better person. David? I think I would say that um, you know, there's no one silver bullet in terms mm. of actually you know, developing and nurturing our talent uh, in the rail sector. Um, you know, we've talked about apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I started uh, 25 years ago as an apprentice in, uh, in British Rail. You're not that um, old. But, uh, yeah, a bit older. <laughs> um, but um, it's also about engaging the schools mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. It's about encouraging more movement. You know, organisations like, um, like Talis, who, who yeah. I'm employed by, um, encouraging people to move between different sectors. So there's a lot we can learn um, from our colleagues who work in the, uh, the air traffic environment and so on. But it's interesting because um, Australia is still a points-based system. And Australia is looking for young engineers, aren't they, all the time? Yeah, and, and uh, they, they're certainly encouraging uh, 
you know, people with skills, which is obviously important. But, but I think there is an opportunity here. You know, we are absolutely obsessed about apprentices. When I first came, they'd cancel all the schemes. You know, yeah. Terry Morgan, Crossrail, uh, you know, driver apprenticeships convinced me it was good to start again. And we're seeing it's not just about graduates. No. It's about people starting at 16, sometimes 30 as apprentices, you know, yeah. retraining again. And we're seeing some really great impacts. It improves morale. All of us have sons and daughters. You know, we may all, you know, a lot of us in this room may be, you know, fairly grey-haired and whatever, but all of us have sons and daughters. We have got to start mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. not stereotyping that, you know, coffee table talks about, oh, my son's a dentist or daughter's a, a doctor. We want to be as proud as being engineers and operators of what is now the golden age. It is about mobility of rail, public transport, and moving around this place. It, bizarrely, at the turn of the last century, my grandfathers both went to engineering schools. I mean, from the ages of 11 to 18, before they went on, they actually were, they were focusing schools on engineering. What is the Australian example of all that? Well, they, they, if, you, if you think about Australia, it's a massive country, very few people, 23 million. But, th you know, they need engineering like no tomorrow yeah. because, you know, digging huge holes, mm -hmm. uh, extracting the infrastructure, Industry. trying to connect up. And I, and I think the other thing about what I'm seeing about Australia is that they get on with stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think I sat watching the debate of, with, with great respect, some, you know, debates about HST, you know, we're still grey-haired old men debating about whether we do it or not. You just got to get on with it. Am I right in saying though that you want to do it in conurbations, but you don't have the same density issues about well, all the problems that seem to be thrown up at the? Uh, we'll come to Sydney, and you'll see the one of the biggest urban cities in the world. What do you think about that idea that we should be having some kind of international? I mean, you don't have, you're not in Australia yet, Costain, are you? Costain, we're big in um, uh, big Australia. In Japan. Uh, yeah, once, once, yeah once, once upon a time. But today, we're very firmly in the UK market because we believe in sort of fulfilling our customers' aspirations. Uh, they've committed to our industry long term investment plans. And as a business, we feel uh, precious in terms of servicing those customers. So the international piece is a very important piece. The role that Costain plays in that is making sure that we have an industry that is world leading in the UK. We're supporting the universities, and a lot of those universities attract uh, people that want to be engineers from overseas. Now, just what you were saying about get on with it and, and the attitude here is maybe less get on with it and more why we shouldn't be getting on with it sometimes. And I wonder what your experience of that is, having done 2012 and then moving away. What do you feel, that looking back, do we, have, do we put too many obstacles in place? The one big thing I learnt was a fixed deadline makes mountains move. And if you really stick to that deadline, which well, you had to in the Olympics... You couldn't, I mean, if you didn't deliver 2012, yeah. that was the problem, obviously. But you can replicate that in ev every project you do. So keep the real rigour of project and programme management. Make sure you've got the risk analysis, the change management, you've got a really good budget, and you're managing it through. Be really strong in what you do. Believe in yourself, make decisions, move on. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I think something which we don't consider enough is that the skills needed to actually mm. deliver the digital railway, which mm. Mark Khan spoke about this morning, are quite different to the skills you know, previously. Um, so, you know, some years ago, um, a signaling engineer you know, needed mm. to understand mechanical engineering, then electromechanical engineering. Going forwards, signaling engineers need to understand IT, yeah. commercially off-the-shelf technology, routers and so on. So I think it's not just about um, you know, more graduates, more apprenticeships, early engagement schools, STEM ambassadors, mm -hmm. encouraging women into uh, science and technology. Um, I think it's also about recognising that actually we need some new skills. You know, a more connected digital railway mm -hmm. um, introduces risks of things like, you know, cyber, um, mm -hmm. you know, cyber security. Cyber security. Um, now, we have to keep that into perspective because, you know, there's quite a bit of scaremongering about uh, cyber there, security. There, were, there have been huge cyber breaches, yeah. though. But these are new skills. So for us in, um, in Talis, as an example, um, you know, we provide the encryption for Apple and worldwide. Um, so we're actually taking our people who work in VAPL and introducing them to our signal engineers. And it is very difficult because they speak an entirely different language. So it's, um, you know, there's some real challenges ahead. My name is Rav. I'm from Areen. The question is, how does innovation in UK compare with innovation in China and Middle East? What is stopping us doing better than them?
Mm. The talent does exist in the UK. I, I would just, I'd just like to make a, a point here, because I think we're very hard on ourselves in the UK. Mm. Um, I've um, spent quite some time this last uh, two years looking around control centres in different countries. Um, and actually, there are some areas in the UK which we are ahead. So in the UK, Network Rail are the largest real-time condition monitoring system now in the world. 35,000 assets they're monitoring. We've been around every other country. There is no other country who's achieved what Network Rail have achieved there. Um, so I think there's, there's things in the UK we ought to be proud of. I think it's incredible, actually, as I say, the performance that we achieve, given the lack of tools that, um, that the industry has in the UK. Uh, of course, also, we've got an issue just now where some of our international graduates are not being allowed to stay, and you wonder whether or not we're, we're letting them bleed away when we'd be holding on to them. But that's probably something political that you would necessarily want to answer as the budget starts. Anyway, gentleman at the back. John Roberts from Lang O'Rourke. Um, very interested by a couple of things that Sue said, actually. Um, we, I've been at several events recently where we talk a lot about getting out of the best graduates in best careers and best industry, and it's all quite testosterone-driven. Um, on average, uh, our graduates are average, because unless you're Michael Gove, that is a requirement. Um, the, um, so therefore, should we be thinking about how we get good careers for average people and how we're going to give them the systems and processes that allow them to produce excellent results, so, rather than going off to the top of the market all the time? Let's look as wide as we can to get people who just want to do the job. Because if the biggest motivator is, I want to come into work and do a good job, you've got the right person. Tim? I think from our perspective, it's a range of talent. Mm -hmm. uh, so purely agree with you, John. It's about selecting the right people for your business. And therefore, it's a close relationship that you have with those universities. And you can tailor their course content to actually make sure that those people, when they do arrive in, in your business, they fit nicely and but, they want to stay. But would you take people into talents who are like 16, who just show great aptitude for computers you know, and, and innovation, actually? Yeah, you know, absolutely. There's, um, you know, there's, some, there's been some great you know, schemes recently. Um, you know, Network Rail, I think we heard earlier, taking 200 apprenticeships. Um, you know, Siemens have an excellent scheme. Um, Talis have a partnership with Basildon, um, College, of, College of Advanced Technology. Um, but I think, um, you know, the earlier engagement is what we need to do more of. So, you know, kind of initiatives like the kind of Big Bang initiatives where we get in, you know, school children involved earlier. Great. Yes, the young man, you're, you, I know you are a recent graduate, so fire away. Hi there, uh, Patrick Gadden from Transport for London. Um, I couldn't agree more with what you just said about getting people in young. Uh, I'll just share an anecdote. I went to a school in Hammersmith recently, and uh, the first question to a bunch of 10-year-olds, what does an engineer do? A 10-year-old girl puts her hand up, they repair cars. And the, the challenge we have is that that girl from that age then has immediately just switched oh. off engineering. Yeah. And we hear some really good stuff that some companies do, but there's also a lot of talk of, we need to do this, we need to do that. So firstly, across the industry, is there perhaps a lack of accountability in who needs to do it? We heard it's earlier that strategy, the yeah. teachers should be telling yeah. kids what engineers are. And secondly, for those industries which are doing it, should there perhaps be a more coordinated interdisciplinary yeah. approach? Should there be a kind of a charter across the industry of how, you know, what you're willing to do and how quickly you're willing to do it? So. I, I, I believe that would be very powerful. Peter Hansford at the moment, he's our chief construction advisor. He's pushing very much for let's decide what we're going to do, let's focus on it and let's do it as an industry. And that's the, the first time really we've had that call to arms. Hi. Yeah, I, I think it's taking up you know, the point earlier about, you know, traditionally railways have been around, as Pete reminded us, for 150, 170 years. We've, we are tr we've got to transform from that traditional engineering into the, you know, the modern opportunity. There are many people out there. And I think there's something about this pride of, of who you work for and what industry you work for. We've got to encourage, you know, this will, this is going to be globally the time for all of us in this room. Um, I think we also need to ensure um, that we keep good, experienced people, but we've got to bring into this industry people who come from the airline industry, come from the digital age, and mix them together. They will then encourage those younger people to join us. Dave? Yeah, I think um, the chap over here said that he very much agreed with my point. I very much agree with his point about accountability. Um, you know, the fact is, we're all responsible. Um, you know, every supplier who wants to be involved in the rail sector is responsible for encouraging you know, new people to come into the rail sector. That's the, that's the point. You know, we all have to do it. Um, you know, it's not somebody else's responsibility. But would you sign up to the idea that there would be some kind of mission statement right across the yes. industry? You yes. would sign up yes. to it. Would you Straight sign right. up to it? 
Definitely, I think from our perspective, uh, having more businesses that are rewarded for their commitment to bring not just young people, but people that want to transfer from different industries, but also those people that want to get back to work. Crossrail have done a fantastic job working with their supply chain, yeah. giving tasters of our industry. And then those people have got tasters of the industry, they've stuck with it and said, this is a career for me. So taking them off away from unemployment and back into work. Thank you all very much indeed to our panel.